business and bourbon. You're a local celebrity around here, rock star in Atlanta, but introduce yourself to my global audience. I was going to write a book, How I Became a Rock Star at 50. Nice. And I realized I was a rock star all along. See, guys, we're not playing around. Two business professionals sitting down, having a drink, and just sharing. We were an essential service. Yeah. So we were blessed that we could continue to do what we do, which is I'm in the real estate business. You've had kind of a not traditional path to entrepreneurship in the business. You don't wake up on top of a mountain, you start climbing and one day you look around and wonder how you got there if you never stopped climbing. Yeah. That's kind of my story. You know Shaka Khan, right? Shaka Khan. Shaka Khan. <laughs> Did you feel like you gave up or sold out a little bit? I felt like trying to make it a business diluted the love I had for the art. When I help people succeed, I get paid. I mean, it was a beautiful thing. You're sitting back as a middle-aged white man having these conversations with yeah. a very diverse workforce. It's our responsibility as human beings to better connect with human beings. Welcome back to Business and Bourbon, where we have real talk with real people. My name is Ronnell Richards. I am the creator and your host. You know, my father taught me many years ago that if you really want to build wealth, get into real estate, purchase land. Why? Because they're not making any more of it. I'm sure many of you received that same advice. So, you know, as we are sitting here evaluating where we are in our lives, our professional lives, and personal lives and maybe some of you are looking at how you're going to build a future for yourself or your family given the current circumstances you know i really wanted to bring in one of my friends one of the most successful real estate folks that i know and a gentleman who has such an interesting background going from a musician to a really important broker in the atlanta community and someone that I tremendously admire for not only their commitment to his craft and commitment to his business, but his commitment to people and investing in people and their personal growth. So as I thought about, hey, who do we want to have on the platform to talk about the real estate business and their experience? I absolutely had to have Rick Hale on this platform. Again, someone I really admire for what they've done in business and what he's done beyond business. So guys, with that said, it's time to go. It's time to grab that glass, grab that cup, grab that mug, pour your favorite beverage in there, sit down with Rick and I here at the bar, and it's time to enjoy a little business and bourbon. Welcome back to Business and Bourbon, where we have real talk with real people. I am your host and the creator of Business and Bourbon, Ron L. Richards. And I am sitting here in the beautiful King and Duke in Buckhead, Atlanta. Um, I'm wishing I had some more friends in here, but you know, it is what it is. We're in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah, we're keeping our social distancing. We've got our face mask on. We're being responsible, doing all those things. But I do feel for my folks in business out there that are struggling out there. I hear you. We support you. That's why we continue to come down here to the King of Duke every single time that we can and, and have a great meal, have some great cocktails. If you guys are in Atlanta, you absolutely need to get down here. They've done a great job in setting up the restaurant to where everyone's distanced. You'll have plenty of space. You'll feel super comfortable, but they need you. These guys need us right now. So get out there and support. All that said, you know, it's time to get into the show. And I know that uh, they have been a little bit more sparse here over the last couple of months as we've been dealing with the pandemic. And you guys know how we roll. There's only one way that we do this show. And I know that you've seen a lot of stuff on Zoom. A lot of you guys are participating in Zooms and all other types of virtual conferences and virtual whatever. But here at Business and Bourbon, it's super important to me that I sit across that table, we have a drink, and we have real talk. We get honest. We get real. Like where I get the opportunity to look in someone's eyes like my buddy Rick here right now and just pull things out of their soul. That's what we're about. <laughs> we're about vulnerability. We're about authenticity. And that's something that I'm not willing to compromise for you guys. We want to make sure that we're serving you at the highest level that we can. So with that said, enough of me talking. You guys didn't tune in. You guys didn't download. You guys aren't watching this 
for me. You're watching, you're listening for our guest, and I have a great one for you today. And this gentleman has a terrific story. He's a really successful businessman here in Atlanta, but you know, it's not about the success for us. We talk about the journey, and his journey is an interesting one to say the least. So with that said, I want to introduce my friend, Rick Hell. What's going on? What's going uh, on, Rick? Enjoying an afternoon. And to your point, I think it's vital that we do support those in uh, more dire situations with uh, the COVID scenario. And man, our community needs us more than ever. I'm it's telling terrible. you, man. I mean, you're a leader in this community here in Atlanta, and I know you yeah. know a lot of business leaders. And um, what are you hearing from the folks that you deal with on a daily basis? How are they doing, first of all? Well, it depends. I mean, it, we were an essential service. Yeah. So we were blessed that we could continue to do what we do, which is I'm in the real estate business. I've got seven brokerage offices and 1,100 people in we're doing about 80% of our normal volume, like supply and demand favors us right now and buyers that want to buy are paying. I mean, there's some statistics that would stun you about activity in the marketplace. And wow. I, so maybe some people are, you know, sitting around pondering what gives them joy. And, you know, your home is an opportunity to elevate joy and create experiences. And needless to say, a lot of us are spending a lot more time at home. Yeah. And so our industry is different than most. I mean, I think some of the service industries are certainly affected and impacted. Um, you know, there's been some, obviously the PPP money and support for keeping employees has kept people in check, but at some point it's going to take its toll and it's going to play out. Yeah. So, so, hey, let's hop into real quick. First, you're a local celebrity around here, rock star in Atlanta, but yeah. introduce yourself to my global audience. Rick Hale, tell them a little bit about what you do and, and your business. Yeah. So I'm the broker owner of seven Keller Williams locations. And One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven, <laughs> seven. Yeah, I, I pinch myself that I get to be me some days. I honestly started with one like everybody. You don't wake up on top of a mountain. You start climbing, and one day you look around and wonder how you got there if you never stop climbing. Yeah. That's kind of my story. At 30, I had long hair. My dream was all about music. It was all about making it in the music business. I even spent a year at the Art Institute learning to mix and record and realized my skill set wasn't favoring a financial outcome that really led me to the life I wanted for yeah. my family. And so at 30, I cut my hair and kind of put my guitars in uh, the, in you the cut closet. cut the hair, dude. I did, man. It's scary. If you saw it, you'd laugh. But you know, just remember, this was early 90s when hair was cool. I wouldn't probably... Now you probably wouldn't cut your hair though, though, right? Now it's I, like, ah, it's, it's, just come as you are. I kind of feel that way. And then yeah. some days I still wonder, you know, I'm in a leadership position where role modeling, yeah. you know, might matter. All that to say, um, at 30, I went into real estate as a sales, you know, agent for Remax. And three years after that, I was introduced to Keller Williams Realty from a close friend who opened the very first office in Atlanta. So mm -hmm. it was a franchise on the move steeped in culture, education forward, technology centric, but people oriented. Culture really was the vibe. It was in our industry, it was a different different flavor, a different way we treat each other with a real abundant mindset of sharing your best ideas instead of harboring them. And so that led me to open my first office in 2001, my next one, 2003, and then five. And then the market you know, did what it did, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, bought an office in 2010 and acquired two more in 12 nice. and 13. Nice. So that's how it happens, you know, slowly then suddenly. Hey, that's how it always happens, though, yeah, it right? Does. It's like it's consistency, just discipline, and slowly. These overnight stories of success are mostly bullshit, right? Like, it takes time, but the funny thing is, is if you keep your head down and you just keep plugging away and you've got good ideas and you're reasonably smart, it's amazing what type of things that can happen for you. So, hey, what we need to get into, because this business in bourbon, yeah. they need to know, what are we drinking today? So... I've got an amazing drink. Ronell himself said that this is what I should have. It's an old fashioned and it's a beautiful drink. It is the and business it, and bourbon old fashioned. We're calling it that. Thank but, you. Yeah. So clearly there's a branded scenario going on that I wasn't fully vested in, but now I am. This yeah. is the business and bourbon old fashioned. Isn't that good as hell though? It is good. As yeah. hell. It's really good. So if really you guys good. come down to King oh. and Duke, make sure that you see your bartender ask for the business and bourbon old fashioned. If they look at you crazy, it's probably because I just made that up. <laughs> it's not really a thing, it but exist. I keep trying to get them to name a drink after me. Maybe in these next couple of months, if I keep working on them, they'll name a drink after me. We're working on it. Now, you've got the old fashioned. I do. I am really drinking something next level. <laughs> it's next level, guys. Um, oh. This is the pineapple, cucumber, kale, ginger juice. Yes, I'm not drinking today not for any reason other than 
yeah, I just felt like juice. It's business and bourbon, but you guys know that it's not all about the spirits. It's about the authenticity. It's about the wisdom that's shared. It's about two business professionals sitting down, having a drink, and just sharing. So with that spirit in mind, Rick, you've had kind of a not traditional path to entrepreneurship and to business. Let's talk a little bit about how you started out. You mentioned being a musician, which, by the way, how is my audio production game. Am I okay? Um, I mean, you're dialed in, bro. You got, this is, it's impressive. You've got your mixing board. You've got this snake looking thing holding your, you're good. You see, I, see, I wouldn't even know where to start in your shoes. So it's been a long time since I considered myself a producer. See you guys, we're not playing around. No, I'm not playing around here. On. We're not just showing up with a couple of phones and no, we're trying to put together a nice production for you. So Rick is approved. Thank you, sir. So tell me a little about your your life as a musician. First of all, you're still a musician. I am. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to laugh. I was going to write a book, How I Became a Rock Star at 50. Nice. And, and I'm still working on the book. And unfortunately, I'm about to be 55. So the title is So did probably, you become a rock star at 50? No. I mean, I realized I was a rock star all along. I just didn't know how to express it. And I didn't own it. Like, I didn't wear it like it was really mine. At 30, like I said, I looked like a rock star. But I realized the mechanics of that business and the people that run that business weren't my tribe. Yeah. That's what it kind of boiled down to. I investigated. I went to school for a year to learn about it. And I took my business degree and filled up my backpack and said, man, I'm going in all in. And about a year of experimenting with just getting to know the industry, I realized that wasn't my industry. And like I said, at 30, newly married, child on the way, committed to building a house. We'd started on it. I realized my income wasn't going to really fund and fuel the life I really, really imagined for myself. And that's where I took a turn. And real estate was uh, supposed to be a segue career. I had a friend doing it. He made six figures first year. And I thought, man, I did the whole comparative thing. If he can do it, maybe mm -hmm. I got to run a shot at this. And uh, decided to pull my way out of my corporate job, which you know wasn't particularly inspiring. And a year in, I was doing exactly what he said to do, and I was getting the results exactly the way he said I would. And from there, it was an addiction thing. I enjoyed helping people. I really got a high from being the human being I was wired to be, and that's more of a consultative you know, type of person. And then at the same time, when I help people succeed, I get paid. I mean, it was a beautiful thing. <laughs> <laughs> Three and a half years later, I realized that although my dream was to own a business, it could work and live inside of real estate just like any other business and it's a people puzzle and you know models and systems and work ethic and all the things that you, you hear every entrepreneur is going to tell you you know similar ingredients to their yeah. path but it spoke to me well i want to speak specifically to your industry because you know there are a lot of people out there that listen to this podcast that are in your business i've got a great following of terrific realtors and real estate agents out there and i want to talk about success what that looks like, how you could, because let's be honest, like there's a high failure rate in sales period, but there's a high failure rate and you've managed to build it, you know, a really successful business here, seven brokerages and no doubt seen lots and lots of agents. What's the difference in the ones that are successful as opposed to the ones that aren't successful or don't make it? Right. That's a great question. And part of it is a tolerance for rejection. And so one thing I left out early on is that while I was in my bands, you know, and while I was in school, I sold subscriptions to the newspaper door to door. And it was 100 doors a night. I figured out the math. So if you understand the rules to a game and you understand strategy, shame on you for losing. Mm -hmm. And so my attitude was always, I may not be the best, but I'll outwork you. Mm -hmm. And if my energy's right, I'll attract the right people to that success story. And I learned it early on door to door and that out of a hundred doors, if I sold four or five subscriptions, I could hit my goal and pay my bills and continue my path through college. And so taking no for an answer at some point is cool. Like it's all right. Cause no is closer to a yes. And so people that are wired for being okay, not winning every time and are okay with the pilgrimage, pilgrimage, I can't even say it. <laughs> You can't say it either. <laughs> a pilgrimage. Pilgrimage. <laughs> like it's an honest to God journey in the world of like sales, especially when you're your own boss. And yeah. to some discredit, some people need a boss. They need yeah. someone to tell them when to get up, what to do and how and to do it. And there's nothing wrong with that. No, that's all right. Yeah. But our industry is popular because it's your business. You're the boss. You can start when you want. You can quit when you want. You can break when you want. Mm -hmm. And for some people... 
that's a doorway to success. And for some people, it's a recipe for failure because they don't have the fortitude, the commitment. They act like they want accountability, but yeah. you have to be okay to fail if you're gonna be held to a high standard of accountability. So when you started in the business as a seller, was it kind of that same mentality of reps, that same mentality that you had from back when you're slinging newspapers, like, listen, I'm going to get as many reps as I can. Did you use yeah. that same sort of approach when you started or? Well, there's a number back to the rules and strategy. Like, so the rules are how many buyers and sellers can I win with my capacity to serve their need? How many riddles can I solve? That's the first question. And then the question is how many people can I corral into one place that trust and believe in me that they'll work with me and refer me. The thing about real estate is it's not complicated, but it's not easy. So it's simple, but it's hard. Hey, listen, in today's business climate, you need every advantage you can get to get in front of your customers and prospects. That is why I use CoVideo. I use it on a daily basis to connect with my prospects, my customers, my clients, and my business partners. And I recommend you guys do the same. CoVideo is offering a 14-day free trial to listeners of this program. All you need to do is go to CoVideo, C-O-V-I-D-E-O dot Ron L. Richards dot com to take advantage of that. That's it. CoVideo dot Ron L. Richards dot com. All right. Now back to the show. So if you're starting, you know, there's someone right now that's listening to this and they're like, you know, this real estate racket, it looks like Rick just told me that like their numbers are 80%, which means it's pretty good. And I just got laid off from my gig and like, you know what? I want to work for myself. They're going to get into real estate after listening to this podcast. They're like, okay, I'm going to go do it. What should they do? What do they need to be focused on as they start? their career in real estate. Right. So in our state, there's a pre-licensing requisite. So you've got to take a 75 hour course. Okay. That shit's done. And that just we'll teaches you, that teaches you how not to go to real estate jail, okay. <laughs> block busting, redlining, all the things that you should already know in your heart, you understand are actually lost. Is there an official real estate jail? Not official. A jail just but for you real lose estate your license, is- you lose your income source and you could get sued and lose everything. So yeah, there, I mean, and your broker could go down with you. That's the horrifying thought that I wake up with some days is that I have 1,100 people on their worst day. It becomes my worst day. I'm sorry, how many? 1,100. Jesus. Yeah, that's a big number. So yeah. somebody made a mistake 30 seconds ago and I'm going to hear about it. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to fix it. That's the thing with integrity and the right purpose behind your mission, it works itself out. Yeah. So all that to say, you asked a good question. First step is to recognize it's a people puzzle. And if you don't love people, probably not your gig. Like you got to want them and you can't be hyper selective and you've got to be able to connect with people from all walks of life. The yeah. gift I was given in my door to door experience, if you knock every door in 10 or 12 back to back communities in two or three different count, you're going to meet all walks of life. And are you an attractor and a connector or does that cause stress and dysfunction in your heart and mind? Like some people just aren't wired for that. And I find people fascinating. I want your story and I want to understand how my story can weave in and out of yours. And then ultimately I want to reveal an opportunity that I can save the day, solve a problem or help you go further. And with that attitude, man, you probably got a future in real estate. Nice. So break it down for me in terms of, I like to give people actionable items, right? Like, What do you do? So, so from a philosophical standpoint, we get it. What kind of person you need to be before you even get into this thing. But if I'm starting, like, give me some, hey, some ABC one, two, three, what should I be focused on in terms of to do that, to do the job? The key is to expand its sphere of influence. If you've got people who know people, like there's two aspects to a sphere of influence. One, we've actually at Keller Williams, we have a model that will tell you for every, excuse me, 12 people, you'll sell two. So if you have 120, you'll sell 20 houses. Yeah. And so the key is you've got to connect with them 36 times over the next 12 months in meaningful ways, in unique ways, and voice of the way that they'll hear you. So if you're marketed, branded, and connecting and communicating a value proposition, there's a formula. Here's the reality. Not everybody's conversion's the same. Not everybody's relationships are as deep or as trusting enough that they'll send the referrals that that model would speak to. So you may need 240. If your 50% is capable converting. But the good news is this, you now know your number. If it's 240, go get 240, you know? So there's a recipe and a formula for everything. So what I'm hearing is activity and know your metrics. Yeah. 
Nice. And then track your data so that you know if your metrics are in alignment with the model. Yeah. And if they're not, don't stress out. Just tweak your behavior to beat it, you know, again, back to strategy. There you go. How do you win the game? Understand the rules and play to your strengths. Man, we're right here with that. Um, and, and those are principles that translate to any industry. And this is what I talk about a lot, whether I'm sitting down with a client that I'm working with or just mentoring folks. It's, it really comes down to having a strategy and understanding the playing field, right? Like there's so many things that can work from a prospecting standpoint, from right. a marketing standpoint. There's lots of things that work. I'm never that guy that says, only this works or only that works. Lots of stuff works. That's right. But you really got to understand, again, to your point, the game that you're playing. And when you understand the game that you're playing, you understand the landscape, then you use the right thing that's going to give you the most or the largest uh, chance of success. Mm -hmm. So, hey, I got a question for you, because you're a music guy. What are you digging? Who do you dig? Who do you Ooh. listen to? Because I'm a music guy, too. I'm across the board. It depends where I am and what I'm doing. From a, you know, I spend a lot of time on the lake. We've talked about yeah. this. Man, I love water. And Can we trade places for a little bit, though? You, like, it's, just... it's available. I know a good realtor. Can okay. find you <laughs> <laughs> no, just temporarily, I, man. Uh, well, I just, just want to just, just come hang out there. Yeah, okay, that's easy. Right. That's easy. <laughs> But the point is, there's certain vibes and energy that fuels me in different environments, man. I like get up and go music that rock. I like the Foo Fighters, you know. Yeah, they I like they Foo put Fire on a live Steve. show that never ends. And I'm not exaggerating. Gwinnett Arena, f six years ago, they did a full set, went backstage, and then came back and played another 20 songs. Something ridiculous. Nobody does it. Two and a half hours. I was ready to go, and I love them. That said, I like that energy, but I also... On the boat, it's all about the 70s, man. The Guardians of the Galaxy soundtrack, lights out. Nice. Lights out. Ain't no mountain high enough. I mean, there's some folk soul. There's energy that feels like a vibe of water that just, I got goosebumps just thinking about it, man. So, I, and I like, and I, and I even like cross culture, like Los Lonely Boys, Los Lobos. Yeah. There's some cool bands that bring a little rock vibe, a little pop vibe, a little unique cultural vibe, you know, using instruments that I don't naturally know or play. And I could dig it. I love festivals where you get, it's almost like are American you, Are you like a Bonnaroo up. guy or? Yeah, I've, I've never done Bonnaroo, but okay. I, I can tell you my three favorites. Tell What's You that? Ride, so Ride Festival and Tell You Ride is magical in the summer. It's yeah. visually, I'm in awe of it. The whole time I'm there, it's all outdoors and it's mountains, 360 degrees, you know, mountains. That's Colorado, right? It's Colorado. And then uh, Austin City Limits, because yeah. Austin has, it's the mecca for creative people. It's amazing. And then uh, in uh, Napa Valley. Mm -hmm. So bottle rock. Oh my God! So if you, you like good wine, nothing wrong with it. Elton sound, John it sounded like you're choosing to go to the places where they got five star hotels, man. That's what it's. <laughs> you're not. We're you're not, not roughing it at Bonnaroo. <laughs> my wife knows she's. If we're going, we're going to do it right. And that's my theory <laughs> I'm on life. I'm there with you. My theory on life: if you're going to work hard, why go halfway when it's time to enjoy the you know the reward? Yeah, I'm there with you. So, you know, it's funny. You mentioned the Foo Fighters, which I have not seen. I have not seen them. I Road am a fan, yourself. perhaps someday. So you say they're like the never-ending concert. I had an experience like that. You know Shaka Khan, right? Shaka Khan? Yeah, Shaka Khan. Shaka Khan? Shaka Khan? Shaka Khan? Shaka Khan? <laughs> yes. I'm pretty so, sure I know that. <laughs> so so a decade or so. Oh, I a little longer than that. A decade or so ago. Went with my parents to a Shaka Khan concert. Nice. We were like, Shaka Khan, let's go to Shaka Khan. And I wasn't really that excited, but, you know, they bought the tickets. I said, let's go. We went to Shaka Khan. Do you know she sang three songs, and she didn't even sing the Shaka Khan song, the one we just did? That's three criminal. Songs. That's criminal. <laughs> That's the worst. She had, like, three or four folks come out before oh. her, like, you know, those R&B slash soul singers that are, like, interchangeable. Like, I think Peebo Bryson was one of them, and, like, three other guys that are just, like, Peebo Bryson. <laughs> I'm like, with you. And then it was Shaka Khan. And you're like, okay, Shaka Khan's coming up. Shaka Khan? Three songs. <laughs> that's she's out. That's distressing. And you know what? But there's a business lesson in this. What's that? You got to speak to your audience. I mean, you want to be memorable, but for the right reasons. Yeah. Well, you know what we call that back in the day when I started my career in the jewelry industry? It's the three to 11 rule, right? Someone has a good experience, they're going to tell three people. They mm -hmm. have a bad experience, they're going to tell 11. Right, so that's why you always they always focus on giving people good experiences. You've so bad experiences, you're gonna now, yeah, right? yes. Uh. Like you know what, if Shaka Khan would have came out and did her seven, did eight, nine songs and did the Shaka Khan song, I would have never said anything else. <laughs> I'm like, ah, oh, oh, I guess yeah, a good concert. Could, but because she sang it. three songs and didn't yeah. do the Shaka Khan song, 
I now have a story that I've been telling for 15 years. Don't you want to, but now don't you want to call her up and go like, what happened? Shaka. Because <laughs> that's up? like it. Like when you said, do I know? All I know is that's really all I know. Yeah. And I'm like, it's a, that's you can all. make it a 20 minute thing with some grooves, some jams, let some people go wide open on their instruments. How about that? And you got everybody the dancing. one song. Let's back the, let's, the one song that she does, that she knew, when she didn't even do that song. Like that's the biggest song. Anyway. Yeah. But Bye great mile. business lesson, right? It is. Three to 11 rule. That's how we were taught when I first started my sales career and just, and just really exemplifies the importance of making sure that your customers, that your clients have a good experience. Mm -hmm. And if they have an exemplary experience, they're going to tell three people. If they have a good experience, probably not going to say anything. If they have a bad experience, the they're going to tell it. 11 at least. At and least. they're going to have a story like my well. Shaka Khan story for the next 15 years. Well, and social media never goes away. Oh my like, God. So now that 11 is 11,000. Mm. It depends on their sphere, their network, who's listening, who's watching. People love a good, gritty, dirty story. The problem is if it's you, ugh, no fun. It's hard to bury that one. No fun. Yeah. So, hey, let's talk a little bit about your life prior to the business because I find it interesting that you started kind of taking that business serious at, at 30. Yep. which you're a grown-ass man at that point. <laughs> um, you know, there are a lot of people out there that, due to kind of what's going on, they're reevaluating what's going on in their life. They're reevaluating, you know, whether they want to keep working in a corporate or keep work, whatever it is, and thinking about maybe getting into entrepreneurship. Or they've got no choice. They've been forced into it. we got 20 million people unemployed right now, right? Yeah. So tell me a little bit about that 20 to 30 and then we've already talked about like what the transition point was for you. Is like, oh shit, I better make some money to take care of this family. What were you doing for that previous decade, though? Well, in fairness, I was still me under the hood. I just, I had a certain laissez-faire spirit of it'll happen when I'm ready to make it happen, and that doesn't. I hope it doesn't sound egocentric. I also truly believe that I was in love with the idea of creating music. It's like art. It's. I believe that a gift inside of you, and I'm not going to, again, profess that I'm a virtuoso, but it is a gift. Like, I hear and I feel and I, it moves me. And so I, I think it becomes cancer when you don't express your gifts. Mm. I paint today. Never thought I could paint. And I found a medium of painting on plexiglass, and I paint backwards. Because if you imagine painting on clear glass, plastic in this case, whatever you just painted, you can only paint behind it. Get your head around that. <laughs> okay. Real talk question. Sure. As an artist, and you are dedicating your life to your art, and you're still, you're an artist to this day. I know this. I know you personally. You right. play in a band, all that sort of thing. Sure. When you made that decision, did you feel like maybe you gave up or sold out a little bit? I know that's a rough yeah. question. I mean, there's certain phases and seasons in life where you make compromises for the better good. Yeah. What I also figured out, so in being fully transparent, I like the art of music, not the business of music. And I alluded to it earlier because the people in the business that just were, and by the way, there might be some amazing people that I just didn't have the luck of meeting that would have inspired me to stay the course. The executives I ran into and the people that represented the clients, the Shaka Khans of the world, were two-faced and not very caring behind their backs. And it just felt disingenuous. And I'm like, this person's putting their soul into music and it's an art form. And the business side didn't resonate with me. Yeah. It was about selling units. And if you're not units, you're, you know, whatever. But I felt like trying to make it a business diluted the love I had for the art. Wow. And so I found a business that resonated. I didn't give away the art. I collect guitars today. I play in a couple bands. I, you can still do this, but it's not a vocation. It's for my soul and my entertainment. And my, you with me? You can run in different yeah. lanes. I don't think it's all or nothing. I think that's kind of what I wanted to pull out of you, man. man I wanted you to get did it. because you got it. It's not all or nothing. <laughs> no, because you know there are a lot of people that are challenged with that right now. Think about that. How many people out there that are in the arts, right, and faced with similar sort of decisions in their lives, man? They're 25, they're 30, 35, and they've been pursuing their art for a long time, and they think, you know, maybe they had kids like you did, or families, or other responsibilities, and are grappling with the decision to, hey do I go do something else, right? And if I do, does that compromise me as an artist? There's the answer. I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, if that's all you want to do, 
stay the course, man. But what I also analyzed is at 30, I had lots of friends who strive, you know, I was pretty well networked in Atlanta. I couldn't name one that was really killing it. We were all just, you know, I had to work a day job to go play at night. And if our income from a gig covered our bar tab, we kicked ass. Like that was huge. <laughs> we were like, we broke even. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, this is no way to create a, you know, again, a solid fiscal foundation for a, a big life worth having. You know, I'm probably not going to tell you ride Napa Valley and Austin for, you know, five day shows and on my starving artist budget. Yeah. So what so, type of music did you play back then? It was and rock and roll, garage rock. It was... Um, you know, realized when we were playing, where I was in the middle of Pearl Jam, Alice in Chains, and B-52s from Athens, R.E.M. So we were somewhere buried in the middle of it. Yeah. And, and you know, that's the other piece of it. You're where I struggled. So some things you can control, some things you can't. And you asked me earlier, you go, you sing, right? And I'm like, uh, no, that's not my gift. I can play music. I can create. I think I'm more a better creator than actual player. All that to say, in a band, you can have the most amazing group of players and if your singer's marginal your band's marginal mm. if you're in a band of marginal players and your singer's amazing you're pretty close to amazing there was too much contingent energy on one person's commitment and capacity and there's also a gap between performance and creation i like creating and some people are really good at creating and some people are really good at performing other people's music and those two have to, I mean, it's, it's just like a perfect storm to make it in music. Yeah. It requires so much luck and someone has to pick you. You know, the suits have to walk up and go, we can sell that. Mm -hmm. And I just felt out of control with it. Where when I picked my real estate career, I'm like, I'm in control of this. It's relationships, it's people to people, belly to belly, face to face, you know, handshakes, high fives and hugs. If I can deliver on what makes your life better, we all win. Nice. What I hear from you as you talk about your career and you talk about your business is this overwhelming theme of of freedom right you don't you're not talking a lot about the money oh, hey, this money is, you're talking about what your business has done for you in terms of giving you the opportunities to be at the lake um going to tell you right doing these sorts of things creating this lifestyle for your family i think that's yeah. awesome to me that's Thanks. what it's what it has to really be about yeah money's only good for the good that it does right yeah no doubt. So, hey, I want to segue into some some kind of uh, talk a little bit about some of the things that are kind of going on in the world right now. And I don't want to I don't want to talk too much about this stuff. What I want really want to talk about is the leadership that I've seen you show as it relates to these things. And I want to ask you what has really compelled you as a leader to kind of step up and start having these difficult conversations. Um, and these are conversations around human rights, civil rights issues in our country right now. And one of the things I've admired about you is I've seen some terrific leadership from you again and having, you've got all these employees and you're opening the discussion and you're sitting back as a middle-aged white man having these conversations with yeah. a very diverse workforce. What has inspired you to do that? And let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, well, first, I want to acknowledge that it's a slippery slope for many people, and me included. There's days I wake up and I'm like, this could really go left or right based on our ability to share our truths and then love each other just the same and not feel guilty, not feel responsible, not feel, you know, empowered or disempowered. And so there's a piece of me that just says there's a conversation that just needed to be had. Yeah. And because of circumstances in our world today, and I don't want to go deep into that, I mean, there's just been some horrific occurrences that paint a picture of reality that most of us don't experience. Mm -hmm. And we don't, I just don't see it because I wake up me and I have my experiences, you have yours, the next person has theirs. And what I'm super proud of, two things. One, I do have an incredibly diverse environment in my company. I feel like my job, my God-given gift is to build bridges between people. And I've got a West Cobb office, a South Fulton office, an in-town office, a Decatur office, and a Midtown office. They're all proximal and to the extent you could put some gas in your car in 30, 40 minutes, be at any of them. There's dynamics that are unique. They're almost like your children where they're all awesome, but they're awesome their way. Yeah. And they're awesome in a unique voicing. And uh, I feel like God gave me the opportunity to bridge. I also have Roman Cartersville as two smaller business centers. So you can imagine... 
I have to be careful how I play my opinion. I want to be inclusive and not exclusive or not, you know, I don't want to push anyone away. But at the same time, this topic is so real because the people I know and love have been open to the idea of sharing their experiences and their story without fear of judgment or fear of me justifying it. So I've had conversations with people that I absolutely adore and their conversations I wouldn't have had without this. So I'm grateful. And then I feel like at the corporate level, it's our responsibility as human beings to better connect with human beings. And until you know someone, you can't truly own an empathetic heart. Yeah. And you can't really understand what you might be doing intentional or otherwise that harms a relationship. Once you know something, you can't unknow it. Yeah. And once you know it, integrity means what you know and what you do are in alignment. And so there's been a lot of learning on my part as a leader and as a friend. And it's been a beautiful thing to open up the conversation. And it's just that. And Zoom's made it so much easier. Like if I said, hey, we're going to have a conversation around equality and, and inclusion and understanding and cultural connectivity, we're going to all meet at pick an office. I might give 40 people, 30 people to randomly show up who are most passionate about it. If I say, we've got a Zoom where everybody's going to come in and I've got you know a guest speaker who's an expert in this arena to help guide the conversation effectively and bring a truth that's not biased to me or anyone in the room, but we all have our room to share our experience relative to that. So there's no perfect or absolute anything. And uh, that's what we've been able to do. I mean, I've had triple digit attendance at two and a half, three hour Zooms talking strictly about inequality and, and the harm that our world has unfortunately bestowed upon certain groups un unfairly and I'm trying to be slightly PC but it's not right and that's powerful man yeah. um, kudos to you and all the leaders out there that are having these conversations that's one of the things that I've seen that's kind of that's come from this is I've seen some terrific displays of, of leadership I've seen some shitty ones too yeah. but some terrific displays of leadership why do you think as a leader that it's important to because you know a lot of us we come from a, a business environment where and, and a corporate cultures and back in the day where it was like hey listen it's all about business if it doesn't pertain to what's going on between these walls we're not going to talk about it what's going yeah. on at home what's going on outside that's what's going on out there don't bring it in here yeah. but i think that for my perspective it makes you so much more of an effective leader and so much more of a powerful leader when you First of all, acknowledge this stuff that's going on in people's lives and then encourage positive dialogue. I would venture to say I haven't been in your office yet because of the pandemic. I was supposed to, supposed to meet with some of your folks a while back, but um, I would venture Maybe to say day. that you've got people in there that are soldiers for Rick Hill, that are advocates for Rick Hill yeah. because you've shown that sort of investment in, of energy into them. That's powerful, man. Yeah. Well, I appreciate the compliment. Um, I think, so as a leader, I think it's my responsibility to role model good behavior and to create open, you know, you, you've got to open doors for people to walk through. They're not going to do it themselves in an organization of fear or built around, you know, you can't be afraid of being authentic and you can't be afraid of your truth. Everyone deserves opportunity. And I still live in the space that it's yours to go capture. Like, you've still got it. But not to own where we are and what's happened and the lack of opportunity that's been shown, you're blind if you don't see it. I mean, that's how I feel. I feel like my job is to just create, like I said before, bridges so that people can connect at a level that one, builds trust, and then supported by a reality of... Um, I may not fully get it, but I can feel your energy enough to where that, you know, I can, I'm going to support you where you are. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. that's a worst case scenario in my heart. And then the other aspect of there's probably some people who want to soldier a better tomorrow who now that they have this information, that whole knowing piece, they're going to lean on people who have influence, other people in the community. Realtors in general have tremendous influence because of imagine. their voice in social media and their sheer number of people. You know, many people go to work and they have the same seven, eight, ten people they interface with for a career. And I mean, I interface with 70, 80 new clients a year when things are going the way they're supposed to. Mm -hmm. You know, a 10 year career could be a thousand and then the concentric circle of impacting them with positive behavior, positive role modeling. You know, it's not about telling someone they're wrong. It's illustrating right and hoping they lean into it. Nice. Nice. Hmm. 
So I, that, that's that's something that I hadn't thought about till you just mentioned the impact that realtors have or could potentially have in their communities. I mean, Massive. you're interacting. One of my guys, um, Doug Ferguson, good friend of mine, sold my house a while back. Good guy. He does a lot of business with the same people, right? Over the course of, I mean, he's been in business for I don't know, 20, 30 Forever. years, whatever it is. Yeah. And um, I don't know, the way you've just framed that makes me think, you know, there are very few industries that have, or sellers that have that sort of impact in their local communities and long going relationships with folks, which could be, you know, again, super influential. So I wonder how many really understand that and how many take that as an opportunity to do anything more than just sell houses, yeah. you know, but to maybe affect affect change. To, one of the things I, that I've been open about is taking leadership and what's going on. Just like you've taken some leadership, I'm taking leadership to affect what I believe to be positive change and um, using my platform. Yeah. When I think about what you just said for realtors and, you know, how large their platforms can be if they want to use it. Well, so, I, I think the winners of tomorrow are people who align with cultural good, people who have a motivated spirit to do more than just their job, who align with whether it's nonprofits or charities or community experiences or local opportunities to serve and lift people up. I think the future of business lies directly in the path of people that do more. Like Tom's shoes, great example. Every pair you buy, they give a pair away. I bought a pair of overpriced Tom's shoes. <laughs> I don't. Even, I think they're all right. There's probably Tom's shoe lovers. <laughs> there I've, are. They're I've never. Eight. I've they're never eight. worn them. <laughs> <laughs> they're in my closet. But when I was in the islands and I needed a closed toe shoe, I went to the islands thinking, "Hey, we're in Tiga." And then the first day there, they're like, "By the way, you can't wear flip flops to dinner." I'm like, "Oh boy." <laughs> I, love I thought I paid toms. to wear my shoes the way I want to wear. And they're like, "No, you didn't." <laughs> so, they, so I had to go, all they had was Tom's shoes. I'm like, really? <laughs> and so I picked the snazziest pair I could. And I'll tell you, they're all right. I mean, they're fluffy and all that, but they're not my style. They don't look very comfortable I wore them to me. dinner twice and that was that. And then they let me off the hook and let me go back to flip-flops nice. and they knew I was cool. But I had to prove myself. All that to say, I felt good about overpaying for shoes knowing somebody somewhere has a pair of shoes. Yeah. You know, it's kind of one of those... You know, it's easy to bitch about your shoes till you run into somebody with no feet. There you go. And then you go, I'm blessed. Man, these are tr sincerely first world problems. Mm -hmm. And all that to say, there are people that have problems and challenges that have generational problems that deserve a platform and deserve an opportunity. And so I think the conversation and the education piece is the first step. And that's what we're, we're striving for awareness and education. Nice. So, you know, as we start to wrap this bad boy up, you've been, a, again, a leader in business for a long time in, in this city. And, and when you've gone years in business, you've weathered a lot of storms. The pandemic is the latest storm, right? Yeah. yeah it's a big one. It is. But for those that, that have been in business for a while, you've big is relative. <laughs> it's relative, right? Like when you when you're a couple years in and you're faced with whatever it is that's going on then and you're you know, days or months or weeks from closing your doors, it's all the same. So you've got some perspective, you've got some context that only time can give you. Yeah. I want you to share some advice, share some of what you've learned, some of the, some wisdom with folks on how to get through this. Yeah. I mean, I have a few thoughts that popped into my head. One is it's always about rules and strategy. But the thing about rules is in a pandemic, they change. Nothing's exactly the way it was 90, 120 days ago when this thing kind of showed up six months now, for gosh sakes. You gotta pivot, you gotta pivot. You gotta know, if I continue to live like it's always been, it may not be. And buyers today think differently, sellers think differently today. How can you create a safe environment to still successfully transact and honor people's you know, wills to expand, create, to invest, to buy, to, you know, life experiences are still, they don't, just because we have a pandemic doesn't mean people don't want a great life and don't want to experience great things. So how can you pivot, deliver it in a safe way that's effective? What is your voicing? How do you shift your voicing mm -hmm. to the environment of today? Quick example, in 2007, 8, 9, you know, we suffered probably a four year run. It was supposed to be, a, we call it a shift is what we call it. It was a shit was a better word. Yeah. I mean, everything got cut in half. Your volume, your net, your income, pricing was off 20%, some markets greater. Houses went from taking 30, 45, 60 days to sell to two years in some cases. 
So you had to shift. So for me personally, I recognize that there's going to be an onslaught of foreclosures and, and corporate sales. And so I shifted and I earned some business with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And during that span, my personal team sold more houses than we've ever sold before or after. Really? And so the realization I came to was that, and everybody's heard this, more money's made in down markets than up markets. The question is, are you ready for a down market? Do you have credit, capacity, influence? Are there people with capital behind you that when you find the deal, they're ready to throw down because the deal's that good? And as the influential person, you don't even have to have money if you bring the deal. And so what are you doing to create a bunker or safe harbor for that day when it comes? And by the way, this pandemic wasn't really on anybody's radar. Nobody's. So I think you should spend every day thinking about what's my safety net? What's my backup plan? What sphere of influence? What person do I need in my world that if things went left or right, I've that. got a place to go yeah. and I can shelter and I can succeed and thrive in spite of? I went from selling 100 houses a year to 500, just my personal team during the worst real estate market we've ever experienced. Although more money's made in down markets, fewer people make it. So do you want to be, you know, Part of the few? Or are you going to herd mentality this, pretend it's always going to be great and hope it works out? That's fire. That's it. And That's so, fire. Yeah. I love that, man. Can we mic drop? <laughs> <laughs> mic drop. Yeah. Hey, Rick, it's been awesome, man. Yeah. Very much enjoyed and appreciate you popping in here and having a drink with your boy. So every show we end the exact same way. And surely you've heard every single show. In case you haven't, I'll remind you. <laughs> so every show are good. ends with <laughs> "We out." So we're going to tie us on three, one, two, three. We, we out. out. Thank you for listening to the Business and Bourbon Podcast. Please subscribe, and if you like us, give us a five star rating. If you don't, uh, have another drink. Maybe you'll feel a little bit differently. If you'd like to check out our videos, you can go to businessandbourbon.tv. That's business and bourbon. TV. In addition to that, we're currently touring the United States with our Business and Bourbon Live show. It's a fantastic show where we do a whiskey education and we do some Q&A and it's a great networking event as well. So if you'd like to attend one of our Business and Bourbon Live events, you can go to businessandbourbon.live. Again, that's businessandbourbon.live. Thanks again for listening. We'll catch you the next time.